the MX370 video is a fake and you can tell it's a fake because it's using stock footage and it's using a stock image for the explosion it matches the actual stock footage from the 1990s it's using stock photos for the clouds we can see that it's on an online database of clouds and you know, I've talked to the the photographer and the person who runs the database and they both confirm that these photos were on that database before the video was made before MH370 went missing and there's various discrepancies within the video itself like the contrails or the smoke trails depending on what they are I mean, they're, they're simulated so it doesn't really matter but they don't line up with the plane and they, they jiggle around so you think, you know, if you stabilize it with the plane the contrails move like this and there's numerous other issues with it as well welcome back i'm here with mick west mick Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Sean. So I think over the past few months or so, I've had a lot of different perspectives on the show, and sometimes you need a palate cleanser. <laughs> so well, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not going saying, to do that. But <laughs> well, I'm interested in the truth, and people who follow okay. me know that I'm interested in the truth. We're not going to agree on everything, and I know that you can be a bit of a lightning rod for certain communities. But yeah. I think you play an incredibly helpful role in certain areas. Again, we might not agree on some of the conclusions that you come up with, but I think your approach, which tends to be attacking the problem rather than the person, so to speak, is incredibly helpful. Because in a lot of these cases, particularly with UAPs and UFOs, sometimes people just see things and they are ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And it's helpful to understand what the array of various alternative explanations could be to help rule certain things. Yeah. Out. Yeah. I think a lot of people, like when I react, when I explain one thing, is it something of a tendency to kind of interpret that as me trying to explain everything? When I'm not, I'm just trying to explain this one particular case. It doesn't mean that all the other cases are you know, invalid. And in generally, there's lots of different cases. Like people will often, like I'll say, like I'll demonstrate this is a balloon. And then people will say, well, can it drop from 28,000 feet to sea level in 0 0.78 seconds? <laughs> I actually get that particular thing quite often. But no, it's like I'm trying to explain individual cases because the more actual cases we can understand what they are, the more likely we are to be able to find something that's genuinely anomalous. Now, I'm going to get started just asking you on how you got involved in this whole business. But before I do that, I want to ask a question that is completely out of left field, but I want to get to it. And I know I'll forget if I don't ask you now. Right now with AI, you've seen these Sora videos uh -huh. with text-based generation of AI and things like that. A lot of your work is very dependent on Photoshop and you know, identifying features that may have described that. And I'm at the point with whenever I see a video, I kind of instantly just throw my hands up and say, I mean, if you notice the MH370 yeah. business, it is going to be increasingly as if it's not already easy, but it's very easy to fake these things. It's going to be much, much easier. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, it's also going to be much easier for other interests to hide real videos within this noise. So has that started to impact your work in terms of just making it difficult to I don't think tell so. the and video's actually real? Yeah, this right. is a question I get quite often, like or an, or an objection, actually. People say, like, well, if I showed you a video, you would just say it was fake. And yeah, sure, it's possible to fake videos, and it's been possible to fake videos for like 20 plus years with relatively good CGI, and more recently with, with very good CGI, and you know, in the near future with AI. But if someone shot a video themselves and they show it to me, I'm going to look at it in that context. You know, I'm going to accept that this person actually shot that video. Because most people are not lying. Most people who have UFO encounters are not making it up and they're not trying to fake videos. So yeah, you, you have to 
be careful. You have to check to make sure that it isn't actually a fake and you check the bona fides of the person involved. You check the pronouns and hopefully there's more than one witness and even better if there's more than one video. But this is a problem we've had for some time and I don't think it's going to change significantly. I mean, if anything, it'll be a bit better because people understand that a video that's anonymous isn't mm -hmm. reliable. You see all these things on TikTok and to some extent on Twitter these UFO videos that look incredible, but there's no source. You know, it's like, you know, somebody in Russia saw this or something like that. But those you can kind of discount because they don't have anybody behind them. But if you have a real person behind a video, that goes a long way to establishing that it's not fake. It's not a guarantee, but I will generally treat a case like that as if it is not fake, absent any other information. So I don't think it's going to change too much. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. Okay, now going back to how on earth did you get into all this stuff going back to <laughs> childhood because i believe you used to have a strong belief in the paranormal and ufos and well like talk me through that. no i wouldn't say it was a strong belief it was more kind of an interest like you know when you're a child you believe in magic so it doesn't really there's no real distinction between the real world and the magical world when you're a child like i was brought up a catholic i believe i believe that i if i prayed to god like god would hear my prayers and perhaps cure me if I was ill and things like that. Things that I, I don't believe now, but when I was younger, I believed those things. You know, a lot of people still believe things like that. Uh, I believed to a certain degree in like things like fairies and magical, you know, when I was a, a kid, when I was like, you know, six or seven or something like that. And then I got a bit more interested in other aspects of the esoteric type stuff. I was reading this magazine called the Unexplained Magazine, and it had all kinds of, you know, stories about ghosts and UFOs and things like that. And I just kind of viewed them all as the same kind of type of thing back then when I was maybe like 10 years old or something. And I was kind of interested in, in that type of thing. It was, you know, to some degree, like a little bit scary as well as like when I was young, when I watched Doctor Who when I was a kid, this British TV show, this is an experience a lot of people in Britain have is hiding behind the couch because I was scared of the things I saw on TV. So, you know, as a kid, you get scared of things, but you grow out of it. When I became a teenager, I was more into like science fiction and stuff like that. And then that kind of transitioned into a, an interest in real science. Well, science fiction includes real science and math and stuff like that and computer programming. And you kind of forgot all the esoteric stuff for a while. Did a college, went to, did a career in the games industry. And then you kind of went out after I retired from the games industry, you, kind of, you transitioned out into a writing career. I kind of revived my old interest in that type of thing. And I got interested in uh, you know, a couple of things, like one of which was like investigating conspiracy theories. Because that's something that's always interested me, why people believe in conspiracy theories and is, is there anything to them? And also kind of the more kind of esoteric topics like ghosts and UFOs and you know, supernatural things. Yeah, and I don't want to lump UFOs and supernatural because they are not the same topic. But there's some overlap, but it's not the same topic. But I just found that very, very interesting. And so I'd set up a blog on a subject called Morgellons, which is this kind of disease that people thought that they had. Wrote about that for a while from a skeptical perspective. Then I moved to chemtrails, the belief that the government's spraying things out of planes to do something. Let's go back to Morgellons first, and then I sure. definitely want to cover chemtrails. So what was the claim? Like, what were the physical symptoms or claims that people were making? And what did you do to dismiss or explain some of the phenomena that they so were Morgellons is it is it's kind of something that arose from something that existed already people were ill 
like they had some symptoms of usually it was itching it was like this severe itching so they were all scratching themselves and itching they go to the doctor and the doctor couldn't figure out what they had because what they had is what's called idiopathic itching which means itching of no known cause yeah lots of people have that i have a kind of an itchy scalp it just doesn't no idea why but people like to know what is wrong with them you know if you, something's wrong with you, you you can get quite upset if the doctor can't figure it out and so people started kind of self-diagnosing with this condition that they called Morgellons. And it kind of arose out of a belief that people thought that they were being infested by something in their bodies. And they started kind of almost obsessively looking at their bodies. And they used these little handheld microscopes. I thought I had one there, right? I mean, you know, little microscopes, little black microscopes, 30 times thing. And they pour over their skin. Yeah, they're going to see something. They're going to yeah, see something. They see something. So if you look at your skin, you know, it's covered in hairs and everything. But if you do something like, say, take a post-it pad and like dap it all over your skin and then look at that under a microscope, what you'll see are these tiny little fibers. And these are fibers like clothing fibers and cotton fibers and paper fibers. If you take a piece of paper or a tissue and you tear it in half, you get all these tiny little fibers. So people were seeing these on their skin and then they started saying, this is the fiber disease, and that's what it was originally called. And they thought that the fibers were related to their itching. And then someone came up with the name Morgellons because it was just, it was in some really old paper of something that had something vaguely similar. It really wasn't the same, but it was vaguely similar. And so everyone kind of latched onto this. And then what happened was they had a guy in the Morgellons community, a very small community, who was like a TV producer and he had some contacts in local news and they got it on the local news and it started to spread and people got more and more interested in it. And that's when I first heard about it. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email through a glass darkly ads at gmail.com. This was back in, I think, 2000 five uh, ish and so i started a blog basically investigating the various claims and i would look at the photographs and i'll say like well that looks like a cotton fiber here's a cotton fiber and this is from clothing you know this is a stellate trichome which is a little bit of a leaf uh, and people will often find them if you live near an oak tree you will you will see these stellate trichomes they look like tiny little jellyfishes on your skin and i tried to explain that so i, I was trying to explain it but it was very difficult because the people involved a lot of them have some kind of physical illness, but a lot of them also had some kind of essentially a mental illness. Like they, they became obsessed with it. And then they often had delusions about these things emerging from their skin. And it was difficult and you know, it's quite distressing sometimes trying to talk to people who have that level of kind of delusional belief. The condition itself is kind of known as delusions of parasitosis. And it's a thing that goes back hundreds of years. And the same basic type of thing, people think that they're infected by something and they look at their skin and there's a thing in clinical psychology called the matchbox sign. Back when people use matches, they would pick things off their skin and put them in little matchboxes and they'll take them to the doctor and say, hey, doctor, look at this. And the doctor would be like, mm, another guy with a matchbox. But yeah, it was an, an interesting experience and it kind of taught me the the value of compassion and being able to listen to the other person. Because if you start coming out from a skeptical perspective and you just say, oh no, these are just clothing fibers you found on your skin and you know, you're know you imagining things, they say, oh, you're calling me crazy. And then they won't talk to you. So you've got to kind of take a more gentle approach and a more respectful approach. And that kind of transitioned on, it helped me greatly with the later work that I did on other theories. And I don't want people to say like, you know, everyone's crazy or anything like that, but the people who have a deeply held belief, regardless of the basis of that belief, that needs to be treated with respect if you're going to have a good conversation. Yeah, you're not going to convince anybody if you come in kind of with guns blazing. You have to yeah. at least try to understand their viewpoint before you go into trying to explain it away. Now, chemtrails, contrails, ex explain, ex you know, yeah. just for the audience, I know most people understand Sure. The chemtrail theory is basically the theory that contrails, which are a real thing, are actually some kind of sprayed substance. Now, when a plane flies through the air, it's flying at like you know, 30 to 40,000 feet. You can imagine 30,000 feet is above the top of Mount Everest. And Mount Everest is 29,000 feet high. Always very cold up there. You've ever seen videos of people going up Mount Everest. They do it in the summer when it's warm, but it's super cold, above 30,000 feet. Yeah, when you breathe out, your breath will condense. Same thing with jet engines. The jet engine's exhaust will condense in the air, the cold air. And if the air is humid enough, 
it won't immediately dissipate. It won't. It doesn't actually evaporate. It gets sublimates because it's it turns to ice. But same type of thing. It doesn't immediately evaporate. And so, depending on the weather at that altitude, when a, a plane flies along, it can make essentially a cloud. And you see them as these long trails that go across the sky. Sometimes the trails are short because the humidity at the altitude isn't enough to, to sustain the cloud. What's happening is the engine exhaust contains water. It basically bumps up the humidity to a, a level above 100%. So things condense out. That forms the cloud. But if the air around it isn't high enough humidity to sustain the cloud, it will evaporate. It will dissipate. It will sublimate away. If the humidity is above about, I think it's about 70% on average at that altitude, then the cloud will persist. And if it's a bit higher than that, the, the cloud will actually grow. So you can actually get contrails that spread out and cover the sky. And this is something that's happened ever since planes were invented. There are records right. of this happening in the 1920s. But people who believe in the chemtrails conspiracy theory think it's a new thing. They think it's something that didn't actually happen before. And their memory uh, and of their childhood new as is of... When? New uh, as in when? varies by individual. I actually did a survey and each person has a kind of a different start date when they think it happened. And usually it's when they first hear about the theory. They go oh. outside and they notice it. So, Robert yeah, F. It's, Kennedy. It's a, tension, it's a tension bias, basically. Yeah, yeah. Robert F. Kennedy, presidential candidate, he was visiting Woody Harrelson a few years ago and he was told about the chemtrail theory and Woody Harrelson said, so let's go outside and have a look. So they went outside and it happened to be a day where contrails were persisting. So RFK Jr., became a believer in chemtrails, but he hadn't really noticed them before. <laughs> he was like in his probably in his 50s at the time. So when people first notice things in the sky, for them that becomes the start date of when chemtrails started. But the theory itself has been around since the late 90s, and contrails themselves have been doing exactly the same thing ever since the 1920s, and certainly since the 1940s, when we started to get a lot of planes in the air during the Second World War at, at high altitudes. There's lots of footage of planes leaving persistent contrails back then. So it's kind of like self-sustaining kind of theory. Like People only think that it's real because they only just noticed it, but they only just noticed it because someone had just told them about it. If so, no one ever told them about it, they probably would go through their lives not even paying any attention yeah, to these lines in the sky. This is a persistent thing with humans, right? Mm -hmm. And that is the first story they hear about literally anything. It's like an anchoring bias. Yes. And this is not just in conspiracy theories. This is in corporations. If somebody, you know, the per that's what, you know, that's kind of why sociopaths can be so successful. They can seed an idea about somebody. It can be completely false yeah. and it persists. Yeah. So, now, why why did you when you retired? See, so I think you sold your company NeverSoft to Activision. To Activision, yeah. yeah. And then you had two co-founders. What what kind of ownership stake did you have? Were you like a um, third of the ownership, or it, well, your third, but it, it worked out at a quarter because we gave a quarter of the company away to the employees uh, at the time. So yeah, I had a quarter of the company, but it was and the then, three of us who founded the company. And then, w did you have a lockup when you sold it? Like you couldn't sell for because they, they paid you. Just, yeah, for four years basically. I was just in there for four years. So after four years, like the contract was up, and uh, I moved on to do uh, other so, things. So you had to hold it for four years. I think we could sell our stock originally, but we couldn't leave for four years. We had an employment agreement for four years. Okay, so you probably had like a hundred and eighty day lockup or six months. Say, I can't remember exactly, but you know, we were we were fine. I mean, because we were being paid as well at the time. It's not like we needed the money. But uh, did you so at least get a chance to sell before two thousand one? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. You? Okay. Okay. All right. So a common question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just cover this really quickly is. How do you sustain yourself in terms of cost of living, things like that? Well, it's basically the money, my investment income from the money I earned back at Neversoft uh, right okay. now, plus like a little bit of money I make from writing. I have a book. I write occasional articles. I do a little bit of JavaScript consulting. I've been like working with a with company on doing some code. And what else? There's other things. Oh, yeah. Occasionally appear on TV. I'm on this the show. The, uh, the proof is out there. Where but they I, don't. Uh, I mean, like they don't really pay all that much in, in oh, no, Hollywood. No, I mean, none of these things like pay much very less much. People, yeah, it's much less than yeah. people realize. I'm sure. Yeah. No, uh, I know. It's uh, yeah. You're not. You're not. You're not making a living doing this thing. But it's you know obviously nice to have a little bit of uh, extra money to spend. Yeah. Buy a drone or something like that. 
which, uh, which I, I did. Sorry for the sorry for the semi intrusive question, but no, it's know. fine. I mean, people ask like, you know, is is the government paying you and things like that? So I like to clear up. And this is something I talk about in my book. I have a whole chapter on it, in fact, explaining where I make my money. Back then, I wasn't on TV. I don't think. And speaking you know, of that's making really money, what's thing. the name? What's the name of the book? And where could people find it? It's called oh, Escaping the Rabbit Hole. I have. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's see. There's, there's two versions of it. There's there's one with a yellow spiral cover, and there's one with a kind of a cork board thing with the red lines thing. And the the, I'll, the I'll new the I'll, newer I'll one. I'll, okay. Yeah, I'll show it in the. Yeah, that's the, the new one, the brown one. Uh-huh. New edition. Okay, and actually, actually the next question: Have you ever, or are you currently receiving any remuneration from any government for no. any of the stuff? Okay, no, the government. I'm not going to push I'm, on that. I'm just, I'm just trying to think if the government technically pays me in some way. Like, I guess they they subsidize me via Obamacare. <laughs> that was probably the closest thing that I get. Yeah, Sli- I get slightly cheaper sense. health insurance. Like, like, I know, I know, Philip, like Phil, Phil Kloss, the way that they, quote unquote, paid yeah. him. Was by offering him exclusives on like aerospace news and things like that, but you don't really, as far as I know, have any interest like that with the government. Yeah. So, okay, all right. No, the I, government I does are, not pay me like to do anything. Okay, all right. I think that's it for the mean questions. But uh, uh, <laughs> well, that was easy. <laughs> in terms of uh, no, I mean, look, people make a ton yeah. of allegations and i think it's fair for someone just to ask you very directly sure no it's fine uh, no no problem you know? now why why kind of getting in, get into the debunking business like what drew you to to do that like what does it for you well it's kind of a number of things i guess i i enjoy the process i've always enjoyed like discussing things where you know there's some kind of science involved where you can kind of figure stuff out and do research into things and look in, try to reach some kind of resolution. And I think it's partly, I have a, this mindset that's good at that, which is really why I got into games programming, I think, is, you know, I was I like playing video games, but I'm also very good at debugging code, which is kind of a, a particular set of skills that yes. you can <laughs> use to find something. Your yeah, it's like ninety. Or, it's uh, like ten percent coding, ninety yeah, percent debugging. It's, like it's, it's, it's code. You're yeah, writing on. games. There's a lot of debugging and a lot of code writing in general. Is you write the code, it doesn't work, and you figure out why. And you can do like test-driven development where you write the code and it fails the tests, and you have to figure out why. And yeah, you know, so it's the same process of investigating why something happened in your code that I use for investigating why, you know, why a certain photograph is the way it is or why a video is the way it is or why someone might have seen something or why, you know, some particular thing happened in a certain way. I love digging down. It was almost obsessively in a way, like in a bit of OCD, because I need to know why it actually happened. Because to be a good games programmer, your code needs not only to work, but you need to know why it is working. You can't fix a bug by saying, oh, sometimes like this number goes above 100. So I'll just say, if number greater than 100, number minus 10. You can't do that. You have to know why that number is going above 100 and fix the actual root cause. So you get really passionate about finding the root cause of whatever it is you're looking into. And so I really enjoy doing that with UFOs, especially because we often have cases that no one's solved yet. It's a new thing. Like you think back to like uh, like the Chilean Navy thing. There was this this yeah, yeah, this video talking. off in the distance. The fact that like this task force had been looking into this for two years and couldn't figure it out. And then I come in, I'm like, oh, maybe I can figure this out with the help of other people. It's pretty exciting. It's, it's fun. And it's also you learn stuff. The science is really entertaining. Were you able to figure that one out? Yeah, that was a plane. It was plane Iberian Flight 6830 leaving from San Diego and just kind of turning and moving, flying away north from the helicopter. They thought it was closer to them because it was actually a very big plane. It was an Airbus A340, which is a big four engine plane. So they thought it was something that was only like 20 miles away. I mean, it was actually about 40 miles away at the start and then eventually about 100 miles away. And they interpreted its motion as moving sideways and it was actually moving away from them. Very interesting. We recreated the whole thing in three dimensions with the original. ADSB track, which is kind of like radar data, essentially, shows where the plane was. And we had the GPS coordinates of the helicopter exactly where that was. So you could do a perfect 3D reconstruction and everything matched exactly. It's a lot of fun. How do you get access to all these tools? I mean, do you have to 
You, I mean, it sounds like expensive. <laughs> like, you know, the well, no, I, I write them. <laughs> yeah. I program my own tools. I did a thing called Sitrec, which I created. And there's also a lot of tools that anyone can use for free, like Google Earth. You can drop in tracks, uh, ADSB tracks, these radar tracks into the, it's not radar, but I, I, people understand it as radar. It's the positions of the plane. You can do that into Google Earth. You can get the data from just online websites. There's things like flightaware.com and flightradar24. You can actually go to those sites, find a plane, download it, and that's, they're free to use, or you could subscribe to a thing. I get a free subscription to one of them because I, I run a station with an antenna that actually records the plane locations and feeds it into their databases. They give you a free business database for that. So I'm not paying for anything other than like stuff like Photoshop, which you have to pay like, you know, a monthly subscription for. But yeah, it's not like I'm, I've got like special access to anything. Starlink satellites get the data from NORAD essentially, which sounds like, woo, we're getting data from NORAD, but you just download it from a website. Yeah. It's nothing special. So I think that's a good segue. So let's say I look up in the sky, there's stars, mm -hmm. and then there's something that looks like a star in the sky, and then it just winks out. What are some common, and that's it. That's all the data you have. Yeah. Uh, what are some common natural explanations for something like that? The most common for that particular thing, a bright light in the sky that winks out, is the landing lights of a plane coming towards you. Now, this only applies to sightings that are reasonably low on the horizon. But if there's a plane mm. off in the distance, say about 60 miles away, it's flying towards you. It's just taken off from an airport, say, like, you know, 20 minutes earlier. So it's still kind of in its initial climb phase. Or maybe it's like it's just still just basically coming towards you, but it still has its landing lights on because planes typically leave their landing lights on for the first portion of their flight before they get to cruise altitude. Sometimes they leave them all the time. Landing lights are like the headlights of a car. So all you can see is this super bright light off in the distance because it's 60 miles away. You just see it as a single light. It looks like it's hovering and then slowly moving up in the sky. And then at some point, one of two things will happen. Either the plane will fly overhead and you'll recognize it for what it was, right. or the pilot will switch off the landing lights and you won't be able to see it anymore because it's too far away to see the normal nav lights. And it looks like something like a UFO that's risen up in the sky and then blinked out and disappeared. And that's something that's happened quite a lot. Now, it's obviously not the only possibility. If it's something that's high up in the sky, it's probably not going to be the landing lights of a plane because at that angle, you'd be able to see the plane and you know, the landing lights wouldn't be pointing at you. You have to, they have to be pointing at you. So there's other options like, you know, like a drone, obviously, or something it might be, or a Chinese lantern that just happened to like run out of flame at that point. It could be a satellite that's moving across the sky and it's moving kind of from the sunlit region into the shadow of the earth. And you see this sometimes with the International Space Station. Sometimes you see it as something that moves across from horizon to horizon. But if it's just the right time of the night, you know, the early evening, it will be going into the shadow of the earth whilst it's still above you. So you could see a bright light move across the sky. It's going to be brighter than Venus, pretty bright. And it will just kind of fade out. You won't like blink out. It goes zoom, just kind of fade out above you. And yeah, that's, it could be a meteorite. There are meteorites that if a meteorite is coming straight towards you, you don't see it as a line. You see it as maybe a very short line or maybe even as a dot of light and it'll just come towards you and then disappear because it's burnt out. So there's a number of possible reasons. I'm sure that there's probably a whole bunch of other ones that you could come up with. And it very much depends upon what we're actually seeing. You know, if someone gave me a more specific like video or a more precise description, I would probably narrow it down a little bit, but just a light in the sky that disappears. There's quite a few possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it happened to me, but it was so quick. I almost even, not even sure that I really saw it. Yeah, and that's, it's that's like, a valid I was up a, possibility as well. Ryan. Like, Yeah, of course. It could like, be something in, the, in your field of vision. Sometimes you get these bright flashes, like ocular flashes. That it's just basically your nerves firing sometimes, and you get a little flash of light in your eye, which isn't actually out there. But yeah, looking towards Orion, yeah, that's, that would be, you'd be in the winter time looking south. Yeah, it's, it could be any of a number of things. So. <laughs> and yeah, it could like be I a, said, it happened, it happened it could so be a, fast that 
yeah. could be some kind of advanced technology or a alien spaceship i mean you can't rule these things out if it's just something like a light in the sky you can't say for sure that right. it's something mundane it's but all you have is that you know it's what i call the low information zone you you've seen right. something but it's in the low information zone it's over there it was very <laughs> brief and it's far away and you can't tell what it is so there's a number of possibilities and you can't actually resolve which one of those possibilities it actually is generally and I think that's why this is helpful because you really don't know what yeah. you saw. You, and but it's good to have certain possibilities. So, for instance, like meteor showers, there have been times when I would see kind of a light streak across the sky, right? And people mm -hmm. who are not used to looking up in the night sky would probably report that as you know some UFO or whatever. Yeah. But the first yeah. thing I always do is I just check: Are there any? You know, is it the draconid meteor showers going on or the Perseids? And I've seen things like that twice. And the first time it was during the Perseid showers, and the second time it was during the Draconid showers. Yeah. So clearly. And it can happen anytime. Meteorites aren't just limited, but usually they're a lot less. In the big showers, you usually get a few every minute or you know, a bright one every few minutes. But you know, if just looking at the light, the night sky, if you stay out there all night and keep looking, you will eventually right. see a shooting star. But you also freeze yeah, your ass and off. And usually they're very, they have a parabolic arc. It's not like they're moving, zigzagging or anything. Yeah. The, you, you often what you see is just a straight line, kind of like a, a streak. And sometimes the bigger ones, like the bolides, sometimes re-entering space junk, will actually go across the sky because mm -hmm. it's kind of skimming the atmosphere. But a lot of the time you're seeing something kind of coming down and right. going through the atmosphere burning up because of that trajectory and you're seeing it from a side angle like that but if something's coming down like that and you're over here you will just say, see a base point of light or a short uh, line based on the angle especially if you're not familiar with it i mean a lot of people think of themselves as night watchers but a lot of people live in cities or live in places with a lot of light pollution and you don't really see the true range of things that actually exist in the sky. And perhaps when that actually happens, you're out in the country or whatever, and you see all these amazing things, it can be very different. Well, I know that Starlink is something that people often confuse, but it's very distinctive. It, it, this, it in yeah, it is. But there's actually, interestingly, there's two types of Starlink sightings that people see. I think the one that more people are familiar with now, but not everybody, is when you see these lines of dots. So you see like a bunch of bright dots in a train, they call it a train, and they move across the sky. And sometimes they will blink out as they go into the Earth's shadow as well, which is kind of cool. And that's the Starlink that a lot of people are familiar with. But there's, a, there's another type when the Starlinks are actually deployed, and now there's like 4,000 of them. They're at uh, an altitude of, I think, like 300 and something miles up. So there's like a big mesh essentially of starlings everywhere you look like if you look up in the sky right now above your house there are starlings going over it slowly a few of them just fairly sparse from where you are but they're everywhere over the globe and when the sun's just in the right position when the sun's like about 40 degrees below the horizon if you look towards where the sun is the sunlight will come and reflect off the bottom of the satellites because they have an antenna on the bottom which is a flat panel mm -hmm. which always points straight down so it's always aligned with the surface of the earth so the sunlight reflects off that and into your eyes so there's often a spot in the sky where if a starlink goes through that region that spot in the sky it will reflect the sun and so you get these reports of these lights kind of like flaring up last about 10 seconds and then flaring down and disappearing and they do it in different directions because the way the, the satellites cross over because they have a couple of different orbits and they're different distances they're at different angles so you'll see one flare up over here then another one will flare up in this direction then maybe one in this one and people interpret that as a single thing kind of like doing these dog fights or multiple things doing dog fights but really it's just one goes over that way one goes over that way and then one goes over that one they're all different they're all different satellites but this has caused a lot of reports by pilots that they're especially visible to pilots in their cockpits. And they're eventually, they're coming around to understanding what they're seeing. I know some of the airlines are like doing seminars for their pilots to try to explain to them what these Starlink satellites are. But it's been for a couple of years now, pilots have been reporting them as UFOs. And they will continue, they will do it as well, well for a few I mean, more years going forward. 
technically they are ufos they are ufos yes are. but they're actually right. not now because we can identify them for the right. pilot's perspective right. they're ufos but we know exactly what they are what they're, they're, they're not alien craft <laughs> let's just say definitely they're not, not. They're no, not no. Craft, right. yeah and if someone has a video of it with a timestamp we can actually turn them entirely into ufos because we can say what satellite it was we can say the number of the satellite and where it was at that precise point in time so you can analyze it down to the second basically which is a great thing but it's still going to cause lots of ufo reports going forward i apologize for this ignorant question but maybe you haven't have you ever analyzed this mh370 video that's been going around i mean i have but like other people did most of the work there like the mh370 video is a fake and you can tell it's a fake because it's using stock footage and it's using a stock image for the explosion. It matches the actual stock footage from the 1990s. It's using stock photos for the clouds. We can see that it's on an online database of clouds. And you know, I've talked to the, the photographer and the person who runs the database. And they both confirmed that these photos were on that database before the video was made, before MH370 went missing. And there's various discrepancies within the video itself, like the contrails or the smoke trails, depending on what they are. I mean, they're, they're simulated, so it doesn't really matter, but they don't line up with the plane and they, they jiggle around. So you think if you stabilize it with the plane, the contrails move like this. And there's numerous other issues with it as well, the, the, yeah, any one of which proves that it's fake beyond the simple fact that it's obviously just looks like a stupid like one of those TikTok videos that you see that's anonymous. It's an, it was an anonymous video. It looks ridiculous. There's three orbs flying around a plane, which vanishes in a flash using stock footage from the 1990s. So it's something that should really never have been uh, on anyone's radar because it was something that was, you know, it was at the time it came out, you know, the video has been out like 10 years or something, uh, you know, several years. It was dismissed at the time as an obvious fake and it should have stayed that way. And maybe it's good that everyone figured out all the actual reasons that it is a fake in more detail, but people are still going on about it. Yeah. Ash and Forbes yeah, still talking about it. My view on that is there's some there, there, but not like UFO, NHI sort of stuff. I don't think there's, there's anything there's there, there with the videos. No, no, no. I think, in fact, the video would serve a useful function in terms of distracting people from what the real there there is. Yeah, I mean that's more likely than aliens abducting the plane or or the U.S. government. Abducting yeah, or the U.S. The plane. government having some secret technology. But yeah, yeah. There's just there's a lot of again this 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 borders into another area where you talk about you know conspiracy theory and stuff like that. I just think that the reaction with the videos there's a lot of techniques that the intelligence community uses to generate fake consensus or yeah. false consensus things like that with i don't know the, the ma370 thing i think that. in itself isn't it, i think it's probably just the plane crashed yeah, yeah maybe it, maybe it was a fault a faulty something or other or maybe it was pilot suicide you know one of those two things seems the most likely to me there's other possibilities of course you can't rule anything out but if I was to like, you know, make a list, I would put like, I don't know, those two would be at the top, pilot suicide or equipment failure. You know, it could be like rapid cabin or slow cabin depressurization, everyone fell asleep, the alarms didn't work, something like that. Or it could be that there was some kind of fault and the controls locked up and they weren't able to do anything. But then they didn't communicate on the radio. There was like a huge shipment, not a shipment, but a huge cargo of lithium ion batteries on board yeah so it could so be the fire uh, that's that's uh, but, but i think fire. i think there's certain agencies might have incentive to you know put a cargo on there like that intentionally but i don't want to get too much into it yeah it's not, i mean it's, 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 it's a little speculation it's, though unfortunately like we we, 100%, 100%. we can see that you, know, you you know those people on the flight who were all from the same company i think like a chip company people Reese pointed out as being being suspicious but you know I don't know. I think probably it was just an accident. Yeah. The, uh, the weird thing about it is Freescale, I'm not going to go too much into this, but Freescale Semiconductor had signed about a year prior a big contract with the Pentagon for these gallium nitride chips, which are a specific technology utilized for satellite technology, mm -hmm. just high 
ISR asset sort of stuff. And you had a ton of these Chinese engineers and Malaysian engineers that were traveling to China. Now, you know, what happened with it? I, I have, I have no idea. Again, I don't have a strong sense yeah. of the way. And I, and I frankly don't like to delve into it because I can kind of understand if there was anything nefarious. Why? So I kind of just want to just throw that out there, but I don't think there's any, I don't need to discuss it too much. I don't want to get it. If, if any of this stuff is true, right. Or if any of the stuff is sniffing in the right direction, I don't want to draw any attention to anybody. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm no expert on the minutiae of that particular case, but like I said, I probably would, would side with the accident over conspiracy in general, all things being equal. But anyway, let's move on to yeah. Uh, yeah, I used to think that way until the mm. pandemic. And then after that, I kind of, you start to question everything. Like, sure. I would say 50 to 70% of, I shouldn't even put a percentage, I'm just pulling it out of my, uh, you know what. But much of what we know to be true is because somebody else told us or it was in a book that somebody wrote. Some of what we know is based on direct experience, which we can know for sure, which is you you put your hand on a frying pan, it's going to burn. Mm -hmm. So particularly on like softer in the, in the softer sciences or, you know, economic, not economics, but uh, well, yeah, sure. Economics, like why is, why is 3% the targeted interest rate, right? Is it, or is it 2%? It's, it's two or 3%. It's not because there's been any strong econometric study yeah. because it's the strong interest because there was a new zealander who just said that two percent is about the right rate and it's just been kind of a rule well you got to pick a number i guess like zero uh, yeah, right. percent ten percent somewhere in between it's, right uh, so <laughs> yeah yeah no, right, I, I hear what you're saying but it, it reminds me of okay, a lot of people in the more esoteric fields like feel that way i think they don't like being told things they prefer to experience you know figure it out for themselves but i think there's a bit of a danger going down that path because there's it takes a lot of work to really understand how the world works and if you just ignore everything that everybody else has done ahead of you then you could be going down the wrong road very very easily flat earth being a good example and you're also reinventing the wheel. All right. Well, I think now is a good time to end the episode, and then we're going to continue on a few other topics. Sounds on the good. One. And we're going to ask you some of the questions about some of the flack you've been getting on Twitter sure. about a certain other controversy. So thank you very much. It's been <laughs> thank an you. absolute pleasure. Thank you for having soon. me. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe, and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. Third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates program. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, 
there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.